Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of us who are joining today. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and I'm delighted to introduce this fantastic session we've got before us. This is breakout number two of the Women in Global Health in Security uh, Summit. This breakout is focusing on women who are at the frontier, at the leading edge of research and innovation. And we've got a really impressive lineup. Before we dive into that, a few reminders. First of all, just to make sure that you know there's a chat function. So if you have questions at any time, feel free to introduce yourself, raise your questions, comments. We'd love to hear from you. Secondly, for those of you on social media and tweeting about this, please use the hashtags w, uh, WGH, um, Security Summit, okay, or hashtag hashtag COVID5050 and hashtag UNGA. So there's three hashtags there um, we'd like for you to use. What is this purpose of the session? The purpose of this session is really to bring together and highlight the amazing work that women are doing to lead critical innovations and research in the context of the pandemic um, COVID-19. They're gonna be talking about their research, their leadership and experiences as women. And although women are really driving a lot of this work, if you are following the media, that might not be immediate, immediately obvious because a lot of the interviews and coverage are really with men. So this is our opportunity to dive deeper. deeper. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Samira Asma. She is the Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization on Data Analytics and Delivery for WHO. Samira, welcome. We have yes. also with us Dr. Rodika Komendant. She's the Reproductive Health and Training Center uh, leader at Moldova. We also have with us Professor Monica Lakanpal. She's the UCL Vice Provost for South Asia. Welcome. And Professor Gangandeep Kang, Professor of Microbiology at Christian Medical College Vellore in India. And we have also with us Katharina Bohem. She is the CEO of FIND. So um, welcome again to all of our panelists. I'll be going through um, questions with each of you and uh, looking forward to having this conversation, exploring these topics. Starting with you, uh, Samira. Currently, only 55 of 193 countries are reporting COVID-19 infections and mortality by sex. Why does this matter? Very good question and data indeed matters and it matters more during a pandemic or any health emergencies because data is the lifeline of public health and uh, it matters because life and death depend on it. A few months ago, yes, we had a very somber number of number of countries uh, reporting uh, by sex disaggregated data, but I'm pleased to say that uh, now there are over 100 countries that are reposed, reporting. Uh, the reason is we ought to invest in data and health information systems at, in the countries. Uh, sometimes the data is not comprehensive. Sometimes it is not accurate and time, in a timely manner available. So there are many factors. Um, countries, policymakers ought to do a better job uh, and we at multilateral level and development partners ought to be supporting our member states so that data can become accurate, reliable and openly available so that we can respond to emergencies such as this in a very uh, data driven manner. Thanks so much. You make a really important point about the critical need for data. Now, um, Katerina, coming to you, with that as a background and how important data is, we've also seen that with COVID-19, it's meant that politicians are suddenly talking a lot more about testing. So why does diagnostic testing matter for women? Uh, Katerina, you're on mute uh, just now. Sorry, I apologize. Um, yeah, so, you know, we do need to create overall a better understanding, you know, with politicians about what diagnostics are and, and what they do. But you're absolutely right that in general, I think, you know, 
the the word testing has never been used so much as 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 on COVID nineteen, and I think the importance of testing has never been so well understood as in this context. Um, you know, it it is important um, for us to understand for for people to understand that diagnostics are essentially data, right? And data um, guide decisions with regard to patient management, but also with regard to policy decisions and, you know, the lockdown um, decisions, the, the reopening decisions have been largely informed by diagnostic data. Um, and so they're essential, not only for patients, healthcare workers, um, and healthcare systems, but also for policymakers. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Katharina. You raise a really good point about how disruptive the situation has been for, you know, ser services that are really quite essential. And if we think about that, you know, although pregnancy clearly doesn't stop for a pandemic, it seems as though policymakers may not prioritise maternal reproductive health services in emergencies. Um, Rodrika, Rodrika, why is that? And why not? Pregnancy never stops. And especially uh, unwanted pregnancies not only do not stop in emergencies, but usually increase due to the increases in gender-based and sexual violence and reduced access to contraception. And the data and the lessons learned from other emergency situations which have shown that reduction in the availability of essential sexual reproductive health and maternal and newborn health services results in many thousands of maternal and newborn deaths due to millions of additional anatomy pregnancy and safe abortions and complicated deliveries without access to contraception and emergency care. And according to WHO, even a 10% of reduction in these services should result in an essential 50 million unintended pregnancies, 3 and 3 million unsafe abortions, and 29,000 additional maternal deaths during the next 12 months. This shouldn't forget politicians, and we should use those arguments to advocate for inclusion in the policies uh, of the services uh, directed addressing women's sexual reproductive needs. And Rodika, what you're raising is absolutely devastating. And I think these numbers are, are staggering and really quite disturbing. Monica, what do you think, you know, as a professor, as a female leader, as a woman of color, what impact have you seen COVID-19 having on women and young girls? How do we put those numbers into context? Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and it's interesting, um, you introduced me to, as a pro-vice provost, but actually I'm a researcher as well and a practicing doctor as well. And over the last few months, it's been interesting in my own journey, actually living through COVID as a woman and a, as a leader and a researcher, trying to um, understand the impact it's had on women and girls and seeing it from the inside as a woman myself. Um, I think we've talked a lot this morning in, in the other sessions about some of the key impacts, which include violence on women, um, nutritional impact leading to starvation in girls and um, also things like being locked down in the house so you can't get sunlight, so vitamin D deficiency. We also know that there's a lack of education where, where we're now moving to times when schools are shut. We have a problem with educating the girls as well. So we've all been fighting towards the sustainable development goals to make progress on the sustainable development goals. And these were slow to progress anyway. And what COVID has actually done is make us take a step even further back. So all of the issues around poverty, education, health, well-being, mental health, childbirth, all of these things we're talking about, actually we're now in a, in a big challenge of how we now overcome some of those things. And just to give you in the, um, quickly, just to contextualize it in a slightly different way, if we think of it in three areas, one is um, time. We know that um, women never have enough time, young girls never have enough time. Uh, Save the Children have come out with a recent report talking about um, the caring roles of young girls and how um, young girls are actually having to care for siblings more during the COVID time than previously, and it was already hard enough. Women, young girls don't have enough time for caring for their own, own well-being, their own physical, their own nutritional well-being. The second um, issue is around 
um, research, we were doing research before COVID came. And there's been an unintended consequence that our research for other studies, other trials have now had to halt or slow down. So again, anything that was for the benefit of women and young, young girls, um, where we were trying to get funding for research, that's been um, a bit challenging as well for us. And the other final thing is about the unintended consequences of policies. So some policies in many of the countries have unintentional consequences that have impacted on women. So in my own area, the women are um, not able to mix, they're not able to mix with other families, but the bars and restaurants and everything else are open. Many of those women can't leave the home to go to those bars and restaurants. So where do they get their social contact? So I think, you know, we could spend the whole day unpicking some of these things. I've just tried to summarize it in a little um, um, compact way for you all. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. I think you highlight these complexities really well, and it clearly shows how this is uh, a, a really an amplification of existing inequities and challenges at this particular time. I'd like to go to um, Gangan Deep. You've heard about how these challenges manifest for women and girls. From your perspective, could you tell us about what challenges you've faced in your leadership journey, both in your professional life and in your personal life? I think there uh, I think when we think about challenges, they're the same for women all over the world. We tend to be pressured by society to have certain kinds of expectations. Our circles of influence, if we think about it, are limited largely to our families. And if we think about professional development, that, unlike for men, has to account for society's expectations of our familial obligations. And that's extended families in Asia and in many other parts of the world. So I think if I think about my professional journey, um, I don't think I started to believe in myself till I was about 40. It was all about looking after the in-laws, looking after the children, looking after my husband's family. I qualified as a doctor. I became a professor at 36. But all of that didn't count if I wasn't also doing all the familial stuff. So somewhere around there, I decided I was going to do things for myself. And after that, I found that I needed to really push myself to be heard. Working in India, is challenging always. And if you go into a committee meeting, everybody knows this story. Mm -hmm. The men don't hear you. You have to practically thump the table and be this difficult person to be heard. So what I've tried to do with the groups that work with me, and particularly with the girls who are working with me, the women who are working with me, is to make sure that they are heard first, that they have a right, they believe that they have a right to be at the table. I think we tend to compliment men on how well they do professionally, and we compliment women on how well they handle it all. And that I think is unfair to the women in the room. So it, at least in my own way and the people that I deal with, I try one to do that, to tell them that they are good, to tell them that they have the capacity to perform. And the other thing that I do is network them as much as possible. I'm fortunate I have a lot of international collaborations. So I make sure that the women on my team go out meet people and understand just how good they are compared to the rest of the world. It's a really important point. Monica, I actually want to piggyback off what she said and come back to you because, you know, giving voice to that, amplifying diversity, how can we actually achieve that in academic research, especially in times such as these? I think um, diversity is, is extremely important and I think we should be um, striving to bring in people from um, all diverse backgrounds, whether it's social, cultural, whether it's um, gender and all. And, and one of the reasons that we really have to do that is because I always think of it like if you had a painting, you wouldn't paint in one color, would you? You would always paint in different colors and you would have different textures as well. And the more you bring those colors and textures together, the more depth and impact you have. So I think, you know, we have to fight in 
not fighting it. We don't have to be um, aggressive. We don't. We have to find policies and strategies that support us. And I think it has to come from bottom up and top down. I think you know from bottom up, we ourselves have to work together as women um, with the men by our sides to really try and help each other to find ways through. Um, we um, have created actually a forum for women so that we can talk about the issues and the challenges. And just just like um, Gangan Leap said, you know, how can we share some of the solutions together? How can we learn from each other about maybe we're not networking right or how can we network better? So I think we need to share, develop a knowledge sharing platform for us. But I think, you know, the men's perspectives are very important because what we need is the, to hear it from the men's perspective. What do they feel that we should be doing? What do they feel that we could do better? Um, and then of course, top down, um, we all know we have to have policies and we have to have strategies from higher education, from the research funders. Um, but an interesting finding in, in one of the reports in the UK recently was a lot of the funding for COVID was going to male researchers, yet we have professors, senior academics who are female. And there has been a lot of dialogue about well, surely it's not because we're not good enough, but what is happening and where are these female researchers who are not at the forefront of some of these very important research studies? So top down and bottom up. It's a really important uh, point. When you're talking about the palette, I had a great uh, visual in my mind about this, uh, this, this image that we're trying to bring into reality as a vision. Radhika, I wonder if you could comment on that because you know, in your work, you've really been trying to get the shift into better prioritization of these services. How can we um, continue to accelerate efforts to deepen this palette that Monica was talking about and still um, prioritize um, the service that need to be uh, uh, at this time? Uh, I would be extremely happy to share our experience uh, in Moldova, small but quite brave. So when the pandemic hit Moldova, all the clinics offering abortion services suddenly have been closed without any announcement, without any uh, information from the policymakers what to do with the un un unwanted pregnancy. And by coincidence, but of course not, we at the Reproductive Health Training Center were ready to help because at that time we were ready to launch our pilot project on uh, offering medical abortion services via telemedicine, which is completely new for the country, but for the region as well. It is a region where the paternalistic attitude of provider is very spread. So I am a provider. I know much better, as you know, to do everything, including to swallow the pills. So how we came to this solution? Uh, we're a team of OBGYNs from the uh, Department of the Medical University who created more than 20 years ago the NGO to be able to be more efficient in developing or implementing our ideas. So during this time, we have conducted several, several clinical trials, randomized clinical trials, trying to uh, demonstrate that uh, medical abortion can is should be demedicalized and the way that it should be, it should come closer to women and don't need supervision, so close and strong supervision from the provider. And we've been successful in uh, getting funds and we are very grateful to, which is very important as Monica mentioned, and the Canadian uh, Option AG initiative at Grand Challenge Canada made this possible because without those support would be uh, very much, much more difficult. So uh, we wanted to develop, test, and scale up the model of telemedicine medical abortion services. And of course, the experience from other countries, from US, from Genuity Health Project, but also the um, recommendations from WHO. And I would like to remind everybody that more than one year ago, much earlier as uh, the pandemic hit, WHO published a very important for us uh, publication the uh, consolidated guidance on self-care and the section dedicated to sexual reproductive health and, uh, of, uh, of women, uh, of course, contain uh, how to prevent unsafe abortion. And the recommendation how to use telemedicine services is there. So we didn't need to invent anything new. So the wheel once more. So basically the services are very simple. Women are assessing their gestational age and the eligibility accessing our website. They manage perfectly well uh, the medications, which are sent to them by mail. 
or they access the um, uh, medications in the pharmacies. And this is very important to advocate for the pharmacy provision and to educate the pharmacies as potential providers. And then uh, one week later, uh, it's a remote uh, counseling on completeness of abortion checklist and the test uh, three, uh, three or four weeks later. Basically, this is it. And we managed to help hundreds of women and we hope to uh, be able to help other many hundreds. And probably because our Minister of Health is coordinated by women, our minister is a woman, and many heads of the departments are women too, a uh, couple of weeks we managed to officially register method or the way of uh, medical abortion service delivery via telemedicine. So it's officially included in the national safe abortion standards. Uh, and uh, it means that we are now uh, legally functioning, but uh, it's just a beginning and our uh, next step are ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Radhika. I think we can all agree that this is quite an impressive beginning that you're outlining with very tangible steps that shows that it can be done. It's not impossible. What I also take from that is how important data evidence-based guidance is to such an effort at the national level. Samira, I'd like to come to you. What do we do in countries where we know that there are severe challenges in actually ensuring up-to-date comprehensive data and how can we use that to really propel the way forward and inform such um, important changes on the ground? Yes, uh, re two, about a few weeks ago, WHO launched a SCORE Data for Health technical package. For the first time, 90 solutions have been compiled together so that countries can and partners can use it. And the SCORE stands for Surveillance for Public Health, Population and Risk. C stands for um, counting the dead, um, improving uh, civil registration and vital statistics and causes of death. O is optimizing routine health services that was mentioned earlier. And R is reporting uh, and making data publicly available. And finally, E, so what if we have good data, if we are not delivering uh, and having an impact uh, so it is a package of these 90 uh, essential solutions. In the coming months, we will be scoring countries as to where each of the countries are based on the score. If we cannot keep a score, we cannot reach the goals. And as was just earlier said, we have already gotten off track. Uh, 25 weeks of the pandemic seems like we have stalled behind by 25 years. It's significant. I will come back to my first point. It is not going to happen without our policymakers making data and health information systems a priority. And it's not only going to happen within the ministries of health. We require a multi-sectoral partnerships with the various other ministries, non-governmental organizations, and academia. In particular, I would like to draw on two ministries. One is Ministry of Interior, uh, which has the National Statistical Organizations or Census Bureaus. These organizations are responsible for reporting on SDGs, and they know very well how data is to be collected. What is missing is the health sector ought to be providing standard tools and protocols so that we are not collecting data in a very haphazard way. Um, but we also need can analytical capacities that need to be built in, again, combining it with academia. There are fantastic institutions in countries all over the world. The second ministry is Ministry of Justice. Very important because Ministry of Justice is responsible for civil registration and vital statistics. There are 1 billion invisible people around the world, as World Bank has coined it. And these are people who have no record, neither birth certificates or death certificates. And it has an economic impact and especially impact on women, um, particularly. Um, 
so these two ministries are going to be very important as we go forward to address the data gaps and the solutions that I mentioned, we know what works. We ought to have good sample size. We ought to make sure we, uh, what we are collecting is representative by various factors, uh, sex, uh, uh, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic factors, all these are very important. So hopefully this crisis has really brought our attention to the problem and the gaps and going forward, I'm optimistic that we have to seize the opportunity. One final point I would like to make with the sense of urgency. We have nine and a half years going to 2030 SDGs where we ought to take the challenge and say we will overcome the setbacks and race, but we can do without data. The question is, are we going to take another nine, 10 years to fix data problems or we fix it now so that the next nine years are going to be focused on data driven solutions so that we can in real time take course corrective measures as to what is working and what is not working. And that has been the architecture of WHO's transformation under the leadership of Dr. Tedros making the organization accountable so we make a measurable impact in the lives of the citizens and to the public we serve and the member states. Thanks, Samira. That's uh, really, uh, you've outlined very well how complex it is, how many interdependencies, what factors we need to bring together. And I think your point about that transformation, the change, and the kinds of partnerships that are going to help us move forward in a different way and propel a new trajectory are really key. I guess there's a real um, dependency here, a link to the challenge around diagnostics, because of course, our understanding of the data, our ability to use the data is going to depend very much on on ensuring that um, diagnostics and other tools are going to be able to help us to generate that sort of understanding. Katerina, what sort of transformations, um, partnerships are going to be required to address some of the inequities um, in access to diagnostics? Absolutely. So exactly, at FIND, we drive access to testing. And so what we see across diseases, but is especially also for COVID-19, is that women and girls struggle to get access to testing, especially in low middle income countries. Um, and, so, and so we have been working, including with women political leaders, you know, to engage in discussions about the reasons for that and how, how we can change it. Um, and, you know, clearly sort of solutions that come up in a lot of countries are around bringing testing um, as close to home as possible, right? So we're discussing with many countries about self-testing options for women, uh, which could mean that the majority of healthcare workforce can be safe, that women can occupy, you know, the informal, that occupy the, the informal work sector will be less vulnerable to lockdowns. Uh, related to COVID-19 and, and much more in control, in control of their mobility and income. Uh, we see a lot of stigmatization um, and so we need more discrete ways of testing. Um, you know, and, and then we also need to ensure and we see that as a challenge in many countries that we facilitate a more rapid linkage to care when tests are positive um, because again they're, they're we also see delays for women and girls. Um, so I think it's very important that we work together to continue to innovate our thinking about how to best reach women and girls through, test, uh, through testing and, and uh, empower them in, our health, in their health trajectories. So I think if I had um, one wish, I would want to see the political will behind testing being led by women political leaders. And I'd want innovation from R&D to diagnostic connectivity to community delivery models. Um, and really these efforts must be resourced to ensure we get women and girls the testing they need. Um, and we still see despite the political attention being paid to testing and diagnostics right now, overall 
we see it's a it's very much a, an uphill battle in terms of resourcing in countries and you know we see a lot of out of pocket payments for testing still thank you Thanks very much. I think you've raised some really key points and you, you pointed out also about the leadership that really needs to be mobilized if we are to capitalize on some of these opportunities that are so critical at this time to our understanding and then in drive, of course, the action that needs to be put in place. Um, Gangan Deep, I wonder if I can come to you now on that point, because if we're talking about leadership and fostering that sort of bold leadership, if you reflect on what you were talking about earlier and the factors and challenges that you came across and there may be leaders in this conversation who are thinking about ways in which to boldly step up. What would you say is the support needed from other women um, to follow in footsteps such as yourself to, to take a bold leadership approach? Uh, you're on mute, I'm afraid, Gangandi. Sorry about that. I think if we look at women who stay in developing countries and try to work in developing countries, um, if I look at South Asia, I can probably identify maybe a dozen women overall. If I look at South Africa, a very limited number. And if I look at South America, again, a very, very limited number. But what I see about the women who live and work in these areas is that they hold their own on any stage. Now, if we are to think about multiplying that number, about increasing it on a log scale, what is it that we can do? I think the biggest thing is to protect women at the early stages of their career. That's where your leaky pipeline is really leakiest. If you can make it through that initial 10, 15 years of your career, then you're okay. But it is that 10, 15 years that makes it very, very difficult for women to make it through. So what is it that we can put in place as mechanisms that allow women to grow at that critical stage? What are the sort of flexibilities that you give them? Because it is a time also where biologically you need to be thinking about other priorities. So what can you do to help them out? Some of the solutions are simple. There are many of these have already been identified and put in place by stronger economies than ours. But even if you look at governments, they state that these things should happen, but in practice, it doesn't happen. So what does it take for organizations, for institutions, for individuals to facilitate young women to grow? I think you can lead by example, Monica spoke to you must have top down and bottom up approaches. I think that is critically important. But I think one other thing that really matters is making sure that there are enough women in these structures. Because if you have one woman or you have three or five out of 200, then that is absolutely not going to make a difference. Once you start to see 25% of women, 30%, 40% of women, then we will start to see the kind of change that allows for this to be normal, not to be unusual, not to be anybody doing anybody favors. But one thing that is really important to watch out for is something that seems to be becoming evident is as soon as you start getting careers in which women are playing a major role, that career is almost devalued in a way. So it's a very, very strange conceptualization, but it seems to be happening. In many fields where the bulk of positions are occupied by women, the economic and social value of that field goes down. So we need to protect against that as well while we bring women up. 
it's a very important observation. And I think uh, many people may be aware that as health sector has become increasingly feminized, there has been analysis that showed that there has be, been a, a gender penalty um, where some of these occupations, these roles, and even um, the pay, you know, there are increasingly um, more and more inequities uh, and lower value placed upon them, as, as you rightly pointed out. Um, Monica, I'd like to come to you on that and really sort of challenge you because this has been an issue all along and we are aware of the concerning um, projections from um, other groups that show an ever growing gap between our rainbow of where we want to get to in terms of gender equity. I mean, in this context now and in the academic environment, what is it that can be done differently to turn this around, especially recognizing what you said earlier about how um, much more difficult it is at this time? Yeah. Um, so, um, as I talked about earlier, I think we need collective action. And I always talk about collective action um, together. And we also need coordination of approaches. Um, I think we still need women role models. We haven't talked a lot about, we, we've sort of alluded to women role models, but we haven't talked about women role models. And I think we do need to harness more of the women who are out there and who are doing wonderful work and actually find a way to present them as role models. And I think that's important because we need to start looking at the school girls. There's going to be very a lot of girls now going through the, the COVID pandemic who are going to be wondering what their future is. And we're actually at a critical stage where if we don't harness those girls and make them resilient, and make them see that there is a future for them, we could lose them along this pipeline that we're talking about. So I think we must think of the young people at the moment and how we can harness them engage with the young girls at school, bring those young girls along, but they have to see that there is an opportunity. They have to see this role modeling at the end and it can be done. And there's no harm telling them about the challenging stories. There's no harm telling them about all the tears we've had and how difficult it's been juggling everything and fighting our corner. We can share that because through that you can provide them solutions. And I think when people get worried then they can't see a solution, so if we can present some solutions from our own lived experiences, that will help them see how they can navigate some of the pathways that we have navigated. In addition to the role models and school girls, um, we've talked about um, other strategies, and I didn't really go into detail about that in, in much detail. But for example, we have the strategy in, our, in the universities called the Athena Swan strategies, and that can be ro rolled out globally. You know, our institutions, such as higher education institutions, actually implementing equality and inclusion and, and diversity. And we have a bronze, um, silver, gold approach to that. And you have to be accredited every year for that. Um, and that means that systems are in place to support the women. So th there's, there's two things, show people it can be done, help them and hold their hand along the way, um, give them the resilience to be able to get there. But the systems have to be in place. And to have a system in place, there are all, like I said, there's the Athena Swan and all, a lot many other institutions have a similar way of, of implementing it. But if we don't do something now, I'm very worried that we will lose the girls of our future. Uh, that's a very deep concern I think we all share and I think we see what's at stake at this time. I mean, when we're talking about role models, Samira, I think, um, you know, as the WHO ADG in this area, what is, uh, you know, arguably a, quite a male dominated um, field, what are your observations? And if you could sort of summarize in a nutshell um, what you think that, um, you know, Monica talked about a way of looking at things that we can support um, women and girls um, to take, to be able to take charge of their opportunities and navigate this complex space. Um, what would be your message around that? How, what has been your experience that has, been, uh, that has helped you to navigate this minefield at times? Um, and what sort of advice would you impart? I'm reminded of my dad's uh, um, trust in making sure that uh, women and girls in particular have the op all the opportunities. And, and a message he gave is that leaders should not worry about how many followers they have, but how many leaders they create. This is a very important point for us all. And uh, there has been a sea change at WHO as well. As you know, that we have a lot of uh, uh, very uh, strong uh, women leaders uh, in various positions. And it is the responsibility of each of us 
in these positions to mentor, to guide wherever we can, but do it a bit more systematically and have a circle of mentorship. We all should be responsible to find mentees, not only in our circles of work, but network around other institutions and uh, create those. And I think I would really applaud the work of the uh, Women's in Global Health that you're leading. It's impressive. And similarly, uh, I think we ought to be mentoring people in countries, not, at, not only at the national level, but finding who needs help, even an hour phone call. Now technology has made it so easy for us to have a communication. One hour of our time to be taken out, at least a month, and give it to someone and mentor and, and guide that leadership uh, through the leadership pathway. I think it is going to be extremely important and we all should shoulder that responsibility. Thanks, Samira. Radhika, listening to that and th reflecting on your own experience in Moldova, you spoke earlier about how the Ministry of Health is being led by women and a lot of your work has also been driven by women. What is that next stage? We're talking about going to log scale. How do you amplify that um, going forward over the coming months? Well, uh, I would go again uh, back to the WHO publication that the uh, to, to 2020 interim guidance on maintaining essential health services uh, for the COVID-19 context. And I would assume that active uh, initiative like we on the token in Moldova are happening now everywhere. Initiative which are addressing women's needs uh, initiative, initiatives which are trying to improve as much as possible the life of girls and uh, victims of uh, partners' violence and all other issues related to women's sexual reproductive health and rights. And uh, it's very important to document the achievements of such activities on the way to complete the evidence-based uh, to try to, maintain, to, to demonstrate they are feasible, they are um, efficient, they are safe, they, they are they accept, accepted by, by the clients, by women and girls. Uh, on the way, they would be maintained and implemented, scaled up largely during the pandemic, but also after the pandemic uh, to, in, in order to satisfy uh, women's needs and women's rights to safe abortion, to modern method of contraception, and uh, their right to choose not only the method, but also the way of service delivery, which is most convenient for them. But for us, particularly in the country, we are going to develop the steps for the scale up to introduce this, the, the, the um, uh, method as the alternative way of service delivery in the country, but also in Eastern Europe and Central uh, Asian region, as we have the role of uh, coordinator organization for the coalition. And I hope uh, this data will complete the evidence based for this important initiative addressing women's sexual reproductive rights. Thanks, Radhika, and I, we look forward to learning more about this as it uh, evolves. Uh, Gang Deep, I wonder if you can reflect for a moment. Um, you were commenting earlier about different stages and at an early stages of a woman's career, really trying to protect that space to allow, um, you know, to enable women to be able to develop. Could you comment on um, women, uh, older women in their careers and what sort of penalties they may be facing and the challenges and how we can tackle that as well? Because that can also be, um, you know, an attrition or a leakiness in the pipeline for leaders as well. Your thoughts on that? When women think about leadership positions, particularly in the developing world, it isn't something that people think comes naturally to them. So I've recently just handed off being director of an institute and one people couldn't believe that I walked away from it to go back to research. But also at the time that I was the director, I was the only one. 
who was a woman among 16 different institutes. And that's pretty much par for the course. It doesn't happen that women are accepted as leaders. So when you go into these kinds of leadership opportunities, you have to almost build a thicker skin because if you respond like you would on a smaller scale to the kind of pushback that you get from in developing countries, pretty toxic masculinity, um, it can be quite challenging. So you need that armor to protect you, to keep you in that place, to keep you fighting when you think that something is really important and needs to be done. But I think it is important for women to be there. It's important for women in our kinds of settings to continue to be seen. And we are, in a sense, path makers. Because if we create an avenue to do this, then there will be other women that follow. I never used to do this. I never thought that this was my job. But over the last couple of years, and particularly when I became more visible, it was almost like it's become a responsibility that I have to show young women that this can be done, that we can stick it out, we can make it happen. And if we do, good things follow. There is a place for them. So I think that's important. And it needs all of us to continue to do what we are doing make sure we support young women as much as possible and show them that if we can do this, coming from our traditional, more conservative kinds of backgrounds, they absolutely can as well. Thank you so much. Blazing a trail, cutting a path. Um, this pandemic's really affected all of us, you know, both professionally and personally. I want to go around all of you, um, if you could say in a few words, what has been your bright light? What has been your motivation? What keeps your skin thick to continue and accelerate your own fight um, in this pandemic? Katerina. Well, so my leadership experience in, in COVID-19 is I'm the co-convener of the diagnostic pillar of the ACT-A partnership. It's ACT-A diagnostic partnership. I, know, I don't know if some of you have heard about that, but it, it's the accelerator uh, for COVID-19 tools. Um, and so, you know, while I'm the only women on that, on that leadership team, you know, I feel that my voice is getting heard and that I really have the opportunity to shape the COVID-19 response uh, at a global level and also to bring other, you know, female leaders in and, and make sure that we work closely together um, and, and drive the access to vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics um, for, for the board, for everybody, yeah. I love it. So being heard, bringing more women in. Rodika, what would you say? I remember one of the principles of evidence-based medicine, any research, any science has sense only if it's addressing uh, populations or community needs. So for us, for me, the motivating factor are the very, the phrases of gratitude we are receiving from women during this time. They're saying we even couldn't imagine that somebody could help us. And there have been women having six, seven kids, very young women in the rural area, or uh, women hiding their pregnancies from the husband be, being in the lockdown. So all these are keeping us going and will continue until we'll be successful. Amazing, Rodika, serving incredible needs in the community. Thank you. Monica. So um, I'm, I'm going to break it down into three, really, into one answer. Um, but just quickly, um, I think the first thing that's kept me going has been um, partners who I've worked with before. So we've had some challenging research projects on women and children, which, as I've said, has slowed. And actually just seeing, um, seeing the, the, the um, way people have 
come together to get over some of those challenges for that research because we all believe in it. So it's the coming together, the holding hands, the uh, talked about, you know, smiling and, and crying through it together. And that humanity and that willingness to actually make a difference, even through a crisis, is one, one key thing with all my partners I work with. Um, the second is new partners. So what's, what's been um, amazing is that through the woodwork, really, um, have come new partners. So we did develop a consortium of women to lead a research project. Um, we don't know if we'll get the money or not, but actually these were women I'd never, ever worked with before. And suddenly we all came together and we were like, OK, we're going to do this. And within two weeks, we wrote a bid and we put it in together. So finding new friends, finding people with passion and doing it together. And the third is obviously, um, well, not obviously, but the third is my own family, my own children. So I have two daughters and actually seeing what they're going through and what, how they see the future and the impact on them. I have a son as well as a daughter and he's seeing the impact both ways as well. But yeah, seeing your own children and seeing and hearing the impact is having on all of them really makes you feel that it's our duty to keep going and doing something positive for the years ahead. I love it. I'm getting this picture in my head. I started to think about economy of scale, but really applied to bringing women together. And, um, and I love that you're guided by the people in your life and those that you love. Thanks, Monica, for sharing that. Gang deep. I think what keeps it together is friends, women friends that you can spend enough time with. You know, um, it's actually friends at different levels. Probably the ones I'm most comfortable with are the ones I went to medical school with. But then I've had graduate students who are now supportive of the research enterprise that we have. And I'm so incredibly proud of how well they are all doing. And it's such a joy to be able to interact with them and relate to them now, not as a mentor, but with having them mentor me. It's a lot of fun. There's so much you can learn from young people. That's a really important point about learning together and also those relationships that carry us through. Thank you for sharing that. Samira, your thoughts? I see inspiration all around us. This crisis has really unleashed the potential in everyone, uh, citizens, those that have even uh, people who have succumbed to, the, to COVID-19 or who's taking care of the patients, health, our healthcare workers, policymakers, we see inspiration around us. And as Dr. Tedros mentioned, that this is one of the best times to work at WHO, to be at WHO and to be part of the solution. Um, it is aligning the entire organization together. It had already had begun with the transformation under Dr. Tedros's leadership. But the focus was countries at the center, now citizens at the center in countries. That's where all of us are driving towards. And the speed and the scale that now innovation and technology that is bringing all of us together. What motivates me is the team here, immediate team members who are working uh, with, with whatever resources that we have. But one and one becomes not two, but it becomes 11. That's what collaboration is about. It's partnerships that is bringing us all together from which we are deriving that inspiration and the promise that the future is going to be better. We will get out of this. So that is uh, the promise of tomorrow. Thank you, Samira. Thank you to all of our panelists. It's been an absolute inspiration speaking with you all today. Um, I'm incredibly impressed by this rich conversation, the, the wisdom that you've shared, um, and also your empathetic, uh, intelligent, um, wise approaches to the current challenges that are quite immense. And the fact that you have not backed down, but you've really leaned into it and you're trying to find new ways of achieving things. And I think we take a lot away from that. My inspiration at the moment is really how much better we are at learning. Um, as a team lead for the academy, we are trying to fast track and improve the way we learn. I think all of the challenges that we have right now and the, the approaches we're going to gain and the changes in behavior, the changes in our processes and relationships are going to set us 
up in good stead. It's how much we seize that opportunity, as you have said, every challenge that we can take going forward. So I would like to thank you all again very much for your time, for your, um, for your uh, sharing with us today. And I'd like to thank all of the participants. Just a reminder for those of you um, who are with us today that you can continue this conversation, the networking session that will follow. Um, our appreciation to Women in Global Health for organizing this summit and the partners has been an absolute um, fantastic uh, opportunity to be part of it. And uh, we hope that this also spurs and catalyzes more action, um, more results, more impact together. Thank you very much. Thank you.